we're welcoming you to the inaugural first edition of our Black Discourse Zoom Conversations. Um, and my name is Ade, A-Side Odolami. I'm your host for today. Um, and we have some lovely guests in the house. Just as a little background, Black Discourse is a visual content platform which shares information regarding the global Black experience. So at Black Discourse, we aim to elevate the practice of oral tradition and curate conversations between Black creatives, which is what we're here to do today. Um, so today's conversation is primarily around the idea of Nigeria, West Africa, homecoming, returning home for a lot of people, and what happens when you return home? Um, what do you do with that? Um, I'll introduce some of our guests quickly, but I'll also let them introduce themselves. First up on the screen in front of me, we have Shaney Saraki. Shaney is the CEO and the director between Native Mag, also Native Land Festival, also the owner and proprietor of a football club. But um, I'm gonna let Shaney introduce himself. So yeah, um, I am the CEO and editor-in-chief of Native Magazine and Native Networks, which is a media company based out of Nigeria, well, between London and Lagos, but primarily in Lagos, covering African music, fashion, and essentially everything in between. Um, yeah, we try to essentially put a spotlight on both African artists and creators as a whole and kind of prop up that editorial, an editorial lifestyle we felt was missing a tiny bit for a long time and to tell our own stories. Thank you, Shaney. Next up, uh, Grace Ladoja, uh, a good friend of mine, an old friend of mine. She is amazing, uh, working across um, a bunch of platforms. Uh, primarily at the moment, she is a music manager for the likes of Skepta, um, international superstar artist. She's also been a creative director working with the likes of Nike and Suprema Levi's, but we'll let Grace give you a little bit more um, info about what she's up to. Thanks, Inside, and thank you for having me on this um, panel. Um, my name is Grace Ladoja. I am uh, the founder, co-founder of a company called Metallic Ink Studios in London. We're a cult, um, global culture studio, so we work with a lot of brands from like Nike to Fenty, etc., to tell authentic stories with Japanese culture and Black culture. Alongside that, I am a manager for Skepta and SARS, an amazing producer from Nigeria. I also am the founder of Homecoming Festival, um, which is a festival of cultural exchange between Nigeria mainly and the UK. And I am also the creative partner for the Nike Nigeria jersey. Amazing, thank you, Grace. Um, next up, we have Joanna Pepper, and you have to, um, you have to bear with me on pronouncing your surname. Chiziki? Is that Chizike or Chiziki? It's Chikezia. Chikezia. See, I got that completely wrong. I'm sorry about that, Peppa. Um, Peppa is um, an award-winning entrepreneur. She has a platform called The Assembly, um, and she's been working deeply in Nigeria for the last four years. Um, can you give us a little bit more background of what you are up to, Peppa? Yeah, sure. Thank you again for having me. Um, it's really, um, it's great to be on such a platform and to have such a conversation. Um, so I founded the Assembly four years ago. And um, really what we do is to provide access to entrepreneurs and creatives in the fashion industry. And access to us means to create transformative opportunities, be that um, helping you know, a young person with a career opportunity or helping them to build a sustainable business. And so for us, um, it's really important to be able to find um, or rather create um, opportunities for uh, creatives um, on the continent um, who may not necessarily have access to, um, it could be business coaches or mentors or training opportunities. And aside that, I do a lot of work with um, the International Trade Center um, where we run um, national exports um, training for women who are trying to get gain access to international markets. So thank you again for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, we also have um, Ijoima Ndukwe. How do I pronounce your surname, Ijoima? It's Ijoima Ndukwe. 
in the quay, okay, there we go. I spent so much time in America, I don't know how to pronounce Nigerian names anymore. Um, so Ijaima is a British born, uh, British Nigerian journalist with a background reporting on Africa. He worked with the likes of CNN, the BBC, Al Jazeera, Sky News. Um, can you just give us a little bit more background on what you do and what you're up to at the moment, very briefly? Yeah, so I I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for including me in this conversation. I think it's a it's a much needed discussion. Um, so as you've said, I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for 12 years, but um, it's really over the past, I'd say, seven to eight years that I've been documenting African economies and then the business of arts and culture across the continent. Um, so that work has taken the shift form of documentaries, reports, features for both TV and radio, as well as writing features as well for, for various platforms. Um, for And you mentioned some of the broadcasters I work for, like the BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, um, to name but a few. I, I actually spent some time in Nigeria because I lived in Nigeria for three years. Um, so I have spent some time there as well as traveling all over the continent to, to, to document the arts and culture scene in places like Morocco and Egypt and Kenya. So um, it's been really exciting to see the trajectory, especially seeing the trajectory over a long period of time, because I'd say over the past 10 years, we've really seen this kind of this boom in production and creativity. So um, it's been quite interesting to document that over the years and how that's built. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, the legend, Mr. Tokyo James, a British Nigerian menswear designer. Um, it was at the forefront of a new generation of fashion talent emerging from the continent of um, Africa. Um, Tokyo James, can you give us a little bit more background on what you do, what you've done, and what you're currently up to? Um, aside, thanks for the introduction and um, thanks for having me on on such a as I said as Ijoma said before a much needed platform um, discussion. Um, I started off in London, so I was born and raised in London. I actually studied math mathematics at Queen Mary University. Um, I started off as a creative director and stylist um, in the UK. Before I'm um, after graduating, I started running my own publication called Rough Magazine for a couple of years, um, kind of spread my tentacles to Rough UK, um, Rough Italia and Rough New York, different branches before I decided to kind of move back to Lagos um, because there was an opportunity here and I jumped on the opportunity to come and work back here. Um, while I was here, I, while I was in London, I, I was fortunate to work with brands like Adidas, Victoria Beckham, Puma, Vivian Westwood, um, in creating digital content for them, um, for their various platforms. So um, as a creative director and, and as a stylist, basically. Um, coming back to Lagos, um, I was kind of headhunted by Manuel Kachuku, who was who is now the current oil minister, um, um, current oil minister in the country. And he has various publications like, Hello Nigeria, True Tell Magazine, and a couple of those others. So I was I was brought in under that um, that wave in order to come and be the digital director for the publications. I stayed there for a few months before I went to House of Tara and a few other companies over here. Um, I started the brand like five years ago, Tokyo James, as as a as a menswear brand. I started it five years ago, and we are where we are today. Okay, amazing. Thank you for that. Um, last but not least, Adesua, the legend. Adesua is a uh, model, amongst other things, of Chinese, Nigerian and Thai origin. She's also an amazing thinker and has been spending a lot of time um, in Nigeria recently, digging deep into the history and some of the textual um, social constructs of the country. Adesua, um, please pronounce your second name so I don't mess it up and introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adesua Aigui. Um, as Asa said, Bibini um, Gel, uh, but my mother is Chinese and Thai. I grew up half in Nigeria and half in the States. And uh, I started studying chemistry. I finished my degree and then I started uh, modeling. 
And now I am embarking on my next chapter of my life uh, with a project that I call Legacy. And it's centered around um, using art as a tool for survival as opposed to escapism in Africa. So in a sense of uh, using art, making art for art uh, with, in, with intent, but not just art for art's sake. So, um, and I'm launching soon and then you guys will get it better. Yeah, thank you, Adesua. And for anyone who's um, locked in, Adesua is actually in Nigeria, which is no excuse for her not having an actual screen presence, but is the reason why she doesn't. So look, to frame this up, this conversation today um, is primarily about the idea of homecoming and what that means as um, part of the diaspora. So um, when people discuss the idea of homecoming, you know, we've seen it, we've seen it a few times in the last few years, they're essentially talking about a prepackaged holiday to the motherland, you know, to gain likes on social media. You know, you see people in Ghana at New Year's Eve or at Christmas and they're taking photos. And then the same people are back in America or they're back in Europe. So how do we change this perspective where the temporary journey back home to the motherland as it might be, becomes a little bit more permanent and people are staying in a prolonged way and actually participating in the country as opposed to just being holiday makers. So, you know, I just like to open that up to um, Shani and Ijoima, which, you know, framing that up as the old conversation, um, what can be done to make sure that when people come back home, they are actively participating and not just holidaying. Um, and can you give us some examples of what people have been doing on a creative level or what you've done personally, so that when you're actually going back, you're adding on rather than subtracting. Um, and that's open to both Shaney and Ijoima. So if you guys want to kind of um, speak uh, one after the other. Thanks, Isad, again, for having me on. Um, I think a big part of like coming to Lagos, if you've been away for a long time, I've always been back and forth, but like Lagos is where I live. But I think a big part of anyone is trying to come back to help is really finding a way to actually connect with people. Like it's more than like, we obviously there are a lot of overarching issues that a lot of people can um, relate to. But I think more than anything, it's not just Nigeria, anywhere you go, it's okay, I'm interested in this, this community, how can I help them? How can I help photographers who are struggling to like get jobs? How can I help stylists who are struggling to convince artists that they need stylists? How can I help footballers who need to find a club, but people think they're too old because Nigeria has that reputation? And I think it's really about finding that community, finding whatever community it is that you are interested in working with and adding real value. I feel so often we've seen in the past um, four, five, six years is that it's easy to come to, um, I'll say West Africa, like using Nigeria and Ghana as an example, and not add real value, but kind of do like surface level things that might be cool for that December, or might be cool for the summer. But you know, when you leave, what's the like? What's the ecosystem that you've built? How are those same people thriving after when you're not there? Like, is that that age old question? Okay, what happens after December? Like, do creatives have to wait a whole year for another job? Like, do they have to? kind of wait for you to give them something else or whatever it is. I feel like the main barometer for me of like adding value into the system is if, if essentially you're creating the next version of yourself, like how easy is it for you to, or rather everyone knows how hard it is to build something. And I think any success story is hinged upon making the next person who's trying to do what you're trying to do much easier. Okay, so let me interject there because I'm going to move this conversation around a little bit um, and jump over to Tokyo James, because you're someone with your pedigree and your background and your studies in Europe and in England and all the work you did. What made you personally move to Nigeria and take all of those skill set to set up what you set up and how did you go about doing it? Like kind of just talk us through very briefly, almost like an ABC of it, how you set how you set up your business. Um, once again, thank you, Asa. Um, 
aside. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be candid. I got tired of Europe. I got tired of the politics within fashion. I got tired of the politics with PR companies as a stylist and a creative director. I got tired of keeping quiet all the time. Um, and I kept on, at that point in time in my life, I kept on looking for the light at the end of the tunnel and I couldn't see it at that point. This was like maybe 10, 10 years ago. I was just like, okay, when is this ever gonna change? Um, and you're working within us, you're working within a system whereby, whereby the opportunities, um, you could see them, but they were just never for you. Um, and I saw an opportunity. I started hearing about the wave that was happening in Africa and especially in Lagos. And I funny, funny thing about it was I didn't even tell my mother. I didn't tell anyone in my family. I packed up my bags and I, I left. I was just like, I'm going to go figure it out in Nigeria. Um, I called my mother like three weeks later. I'm like, oh, where have you been? I'm like, I'm in Lagos. Um, and when are you coming back? And I was like, I'm not. Um, I think I left because I, I had the opportunity given to me um, because I had a way of coming into the system over here through the fact that I was being brought in as a um, with a job. So the job did come with some perks. So it did come with a house. It did come with a car and everything like that. Um, and I saw that opportunity. And I, as I said, I, I left. So while I was on ground, I used that opportunity while I was with the company to kind of navigate my, navigate my way within the Nigerian fashion. Because the way it operates here is totally different from the way it, 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 it is in London. Um, and I used that opportunity to navigate my way to meeting the right people and knowing knowing the, the way things work here and knowing the gatekeepers of, of this part. I didn't come at first as in, oh, I'm from London and I'm all this and I'm all that. I, I literally stripped myself back to the bare bones and I was just like, I'm here to learn and make it work like everybody else. Um, and that's basically what I kind of did. Um, it's okay, so I'm, I'm gonna sorry, I'm gonna interject there because I, you know, as I as I want to kind of keep this flowing, um, I want to jump over to someone like Adesua who has spent time in Nigeria working um, on different levels as a model in the industry, obviously abroad, but also working on things like a Rise Fashion Week, and then working on our own personal projects. Um, and by the way, for anyone who wants to ask questions to the panel. Um, please drop some questions into the chat and we're going to have a little Q&A session towards the end of all of this. So feel free to ask some questions into the chat. Um, so Adesua, just um, from your perspective and, you know, following on from what Tokyo James has just spoken about, um, coming back to a place like Nigeria, especially as someone who's come from the fashion industry, which is, I guess, probably um, very sophisticated and old in Europe and America, and then coming into Nigeria, how did you manage to kind of get like your feet wet and on the ground and manage to kind of get yourself into the business and then also develop all the stuff that you're doing on a personal level? Um, I just wasn't scared. Uh, I didn't listen to anybody's uh, fears on what Nigeria is as an adult or as a girl or a female. Uh, just, what are those fears? What are those fears about what Nigeria is? For some of the people who've maybe been and uh, not sure, but what, what, are the, what, what is it that people think Nigeria is before they get there? And what is true about that and what's untrue? I mean, I mean, people hear a lot of horrible stories about Africa in general and the perception of Nigeria is really quite, you know, even before SARS, before the end SARS protest, it was bad, but it was getting better. Uh, digitally thanks to grace and you know the the music and you know africa was becoming on the map and um but basically <sighs> where did i start nigeria nigeria oh sorry dude. um i would say i don't know it's a kind of like a loaded question in itself but from my experience um people think People think horrible things of Nigeria, but Nigeria is the most amazing place in the entire world. Because in the same way that all these crazy things happen, 
there's all the same energy that gives you the, the opposite uh, opposite reaction. Um, but a lot of those good things aren't shown or publicized, I guess, because you know, bad news travels faster as well. Um, but no, there's a, there's a lot of beauty, there's a lot of joy, and there's so much magic in Africa, in Nigeria, even in all the despair, quote unquote, um, there's still so much to be celebrated about. Um, but I think that people just have to come and do exactly what Tokyo said, which is take down everything that you know about yourself and about the world that you know, and just accept this new place. Literally just come in and say, okay, what are you giving? Like, just learn, don't try to assume, don't try to assert any beliefs and just be. Okay, thank you for that. So Grace, I'm gonna jump over to you because you did something very specific, which I've kind of witnessed uh, firsthand, which was you went back to Nigeria. Someone's still living in the UK, but of Nigerian descent, and you started um, an event, um, which is probably the best way to put it, which is the homecoming event, which is once a year, which encompasses like live shows, bringing together of like international and Nigerian talent. You've got workshops, um, you bring in a bunch of different streetwear and fashion brands. First of all, what kind of led you to come up with this idea? What, you know, what took you there? And how, you know, in real terms, in the shortest possible way, did you manage to kind of get that off the ground? Knowing the amount of bureaucracy and red tape and just work that you have to do to get anything done in Nigeria. Like, can you just give us some background on that? Okay, so when we started Homecoming Festival, I'm gonna shout out Greatness Dex because he coined that name and it's a great name because it exactly epitomizes what it's supposed to do, it's a homecoming. And I think that what was really important for us is for people to meet people like them. I think sometimes when you go back to Africa, you wanna be integrated with people like you. Like I'm into art, I'm into fashion, I'm into sports, I'm into skate. Those are things that energize me and I wanna meet people that are around the same Kind of interested me so homecoming was very specific in its target it was targeting a certain type of people and it was to target in the new wave and obviously there's amazing festivals in nigeria there's native land festival there's giddy fest there's like incredible times it all happened at a specific period but for us it was really about this exchange like i feel like there was a lot for me to learn and there's a lot for people in nigeria to learn from people like me so it's an exchange about you know skill sets it's about empowerment, it's about, you know, talking about uh, equality, all of the things that's given people a platform. And I think that when we started the festival, the main goal was that everyone had a takeaway. If you come to homecoming, you have to add value. The whole purpose was how do you add value to the creative community there? And I think that that's really important. I always feel like when you approach anything that is not in your home country, find your people, find people that are gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to amplify their voices so that they can help you to get across the message you want to make. So we worked, we worked with Native Land on our football festival. We worked with Ball Off. We found lots of little institutions that we that are already established there. Not little, sorry. We found different institutions that were established there and we partnered with them on creating a festival. So everyone felt like they were valued. It's not about coming in to take, there's nothing to take over. There's nothing to do there that is about you. It's about what's your purpose here? Our purpose is to add value to the continent. How can we be of service to the continent? That's what we, my role is in the diaspora. And I think that the festival was set out to do that. And I think that even someone like you or Tremaine that went to Nigeria, maybe for the first time in a long time, came back and that feeling was felt. Like, how do I go and do something purposeful? How can I, you know, how can we work with the skate, the skate community to get their brand off the ground? How can we, amplify designers and put them next to other designers like off-white next to motherland like that's important psychologically that immediately places them in the same space so people in globally start to understand that there is a lot of creative value there it's just about how do we how is it best communicated and how do we make sure that it stays in the gatekeeper's hands i think that's really important that there's a lot of, a lot of, there's a gold rush to Africa right now. It's, it's on, like Shaney will know, music, everyone's getting signed. It's on, it's all the way turned up. But what is staying in Africa? People are signing deals all across the world. That's great. But how do we sustain in Africa? And I think that that's what's really important in general from these kind of uh, festivals and these conversations. How do we make it sustainable? How do people come back? How do you add value to the continent? And then how do we build economical independence in the continent? We really 
put a strong focus on making sure that people, everyone was paid if we, we did stuff there. Like, you're, it's not exploitative. We try to make sure that there was exchanges that happened outside of Nigeria. So we did like a thing with Browns in the UK and got grand stopped. It's about group, like an exchange both sides. And that was really important. I hope I answered some of your question there. No, you did. And, you know, I'm going to come back to revisit some points that you made in here, but um, I want to get Ijaima and uh, Pepper um, on the line. So here's a question for you guys. Um, and it's a very kind of like clipped question, but I hope we can expand on it. So despite the nuanced challenge Nigeria holds and everyone, you know, those challenges are obvious to anyone who spent time in Nigeria or anyone who lives there. Um, it seems that Crave Optimism is a growing currency and that people are very optimistic about creativity in Nigeria, in West Africa, in Africa as a whole. Um, so just from your experiences and work that you guys have done, um, can you give us some examples of creatives that are currently helping shape some of the situations in Nigeria? That's politically, culturally, and economically. Because I think one of the things that we spoke about when we were sort of building out this, this talk was it's great to talk about the creatives and to bring all of us to the, to the forefront, but ultimately we're kind of in a privileged sector, you know, like the people who are doing the work, the nitty gritty work to change the way the country is, probably are not the ones who are at the forefront or the most creative or the most privileged, you know? So if there's um, some information that you guys have on who some of those people have, it'd be, be who some of those people are, excuse me, it would be great if you could share that with us. Yeah, so I, I think for us who are of Nigerian heritage, we've, we've always known that this creativity exists. We've always been aware of it. We've always, like, we've always had it around us. But I think what's interesting right now is that it's come into this kind of global stage. And I think through that, we've seen a number of people become cultural ambassadors for the country. And... And they are, in fact, there are people who are, who are gaining, you know, incredible recognition that maybe were not as well known maybe 10 years ago. And I mean, I, I'm going to speak about the, the contemporary art scene. If we take that, for example, and you look at the growth of demand um, in contemporary, contemporary art from Africa, um, which has led to, you know, international um, auction houses setting up fairs and sales that are dedicated to contemporary and modern African art. And we're seeing the value of African art rising and rising and rising. And um, so you're seeing artists who are now able, who are gaining international recognition. And um, the two that I would, I would say that are notable because I just, I absolutely love their work. They're, they're extremely talented. Um, Victor Ekemeno, and then also Peju Alatiche. Um, who have, um, their value of their work has just rocketed over the years. And they haven't just taken that money and just kind of gone on and, can, and kind of buried themselves in their work. They've actually set up artist residencies to nurture um, young talent in Nigeria. So they're actually reinvesting that money back into the country. And I think they're powerful role models for young people who are, you know, kind of starting out and can see that they can actually they can have a career as an artist and actually and actually make a living. And it's also caused us as a society to take a step back and reevaluate ourselves. And we're starting to understand our value and to understand that work from Nigeria has value rather than, you know, buying art in Portugal or, or Italy or, or in other places. We're seeing that value in ourselves. And that's that's helped to build that domestic art market. So let me let me let me just um cut cut into your 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 flow for a minute um interesting point that you've raised about you know the value of african art and nigerian art and this is great um when i speak to someone like grace for instance and we talk about the boom in nigerian music and you know like uh, uh, afrobeat over the last let's say five years um you know one of the obvious issues is the fact that people are getting signed but are they getting signed by nigerian record labels and nigerian businesses so my question to you in terms of like this this art value rising is are is the business side of it being built from inside nigeria or outside nigeria because what it seems to be to be and you know correct me if i'm wrong is that we export the culture you know we export the art we export the ideas but are people also simultaneously building the galleries? Are they building the business structures? Or is that something that seems to be happening outside of Nigeria and then the culture's kind of going? 
So, so what's, what is actually done is really interesting. So that global recognition has, has caused us to reevaluate ourselves and to understand the value in it. And that that is big business, that you can make money from it. And then that's causing people to then start to establish these spaces for, for our artists. So I, I think it's, it's kind of a, it's a two way thing that's happened where the global recognition has kind of prompted us to understand that this is not, this is not just kind of people, you know, exercising a hobby. This is, this is big business. Right. Um, I'd like to get Pepper um, in a conversation, wherever she is. There's so many people in there right now. I'm <laughs> like, I'm darting around the room. How? Pepper, are you there? Yes, I am. I am. Um, yeah, just to echo um, Ijama. So um, I think that the whole idea of export is for the fact that you can export art, export fashion, music, you know, there's no way that that's not going to cap, that that's not going to grow the economy locally. And so if you were to sit here and, you know, name all the names, I think that would be a whole nother um, conversation. I mean, apart from everybody on this panel, um, there are people, individuals like Ijama said that you may not have heard of them 10 years ago, but because of the consistency and the commitment to growing local talent, um, you now hear of them now. So people like Tokini Peterside come to mind with ArtX and what she's been able to build with that platform for the past five years. Or if you look at someone like Omayere Kerele, who built Lagos Fashion Week 10 years ago. Um, and it is funny because when I first came to Nigeria, I was already like in my 20s. And it was, you know, the first thing I did was to find, you know, individuals like these who I knew had this shared passion and genuinity about wanting to grow, um, you know, the industries, be that art, music or fashion. Um, when I think about even technology and, you know, how we have um, Yabacon, which is the... Um, the Silicon Valley of Lagos, um, and you look at individuals like Boson Tijani and how they've been able to build a whole entire um, infrastructure on just growing local tech talent that has been able to feed into the creative industries. These are really, really important when you're looking at how do we build institutions. And so these are just a few names. There's Papa Omotayo of the White Space Creative Industry, who's been very, very committed to growing young talent. Um, and just to also climb onto what Grace mentioned, it's, it's really important that when um, companies and organizations or individuals want to come back, you try to identify these platforms as opposed to replicating. And how can you then um, amplify what's already happening so that the impact is deeper and not surface level. And um, I, I know like we've had like 20 young creatives who have never worked in fashion, never worked in retail, but because of homecoming, they've been able to go in and literally, sorry, home, this is evening in my house and kids are around, but um, you know, they've been able to learn retail, you know, just from homecoming alone. They learn the trick, they learn the trade, and from that, they've been able to get other jobs and be even more valuable to the local fashion industry. So I think that um, when we do talk about these individuals, yeah, I think I'll stop now. <laughs> but I, I, I hope, you know, you got the gist of what I was trying to say. And I've been, they've been quiet the whole time, but when, I, when you called my name, they came running down the stairs. I don't know. That's what, that's what, that's what family do now. It's great to hear them. Um, so, Can I just add something? Yeah, no, please go ahead, Ijama. No, just, just because I, I know you were, we were talking earlier about, you know, are we just exporting all this creativity, but we're not really getting anything back? And I, I actually think it's, um, it's a powerful form. This cultural influence that we're building around the world is a, is a powerful form of soft power. And I mean, when you look at the US, they did that very successfully. I mean, initially. You know, we were listening, we were watching their films, we were watching their TV, um, listening to the music, and then, you know, that translated into buying the products. So I actually think it's a, it's a very powerful form of, of exporting our culture and, and, and growing in power. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Odessa is still on the line. I know she's got issues with her Wi-Fi, which is coming directly from... Um, Lagos Wi-Fi or Ekoi Wi-Fi. So um, we might have lost her on this line. What I want to do is a quick roundup. And, you know, we've got some Q&A questions from the people who are listening in. So I want to share those with you. But just um, from my notes, 
Here's a very, um, I just want a quick, almost one minute, two minute soundbite from each one of you, which is if I am part of the diaspora and I am listening in on this, or I plan to go to Nigeria at some point in the, in the, in the near future or West Africa, what is most necessary for me to bear in mind? What is needed, right? What is needed from someone who doesn't live in that country that can be brought back to that country to help um, and to create some sense of progress? Because I think more than anything, you know, everyone brings a skill set with them individually, right? And some people bring that as a group. Um, so just starting from Shaney, if someone was coming to the country right now and they wanted to plant some roots and get involved, what would you, on your personal take, be the most important thing that they could add? Um, for me, the most important thing would be, and it's something that's been echoed already, is this idea of amplification. Wherever you, like, I, always, I work a lot in music, so I always say in music, like, nothing is new. Like, everything comes from something else. A lot of people come back to Nigeria for the first time, or they go to Ghana, or wherever they're going, and they're, is that and it's not just like diaspora people even nigerians nigerians will come back and be like oh i want to start this business no one is doing this here but someone probably is doing that there. so it's figuring out what is already there and how you can amplify it to take it to the next level and it doesn't have to be like it's not charity it's like like any business like you're figuring out what's on ground how can i do something differently how can i add to the ecosystem that's already there and that can vary from fashion art music, sports, what can I do to further aid the goals of the people who have already been doing this thing? And I feel like both Idrom and I think Pepper mentioned that there are so many people in Nigeria who have kind of laid the foundation for what's happening now. I'm a bit like, younger than a lot of these people. So when even I started getting into the culture scene here, a lot of things had already been done, but these guys didn't get awards or Oops, we've got frozen. Uh, Shaney, are you still there? Shaney? Okay, we're frozen. I'm going to jump over to Ijoima. Are you over there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I, I actually, um, following on from Shaney's point, I actually think the power, I think um, the power of collaboration is underestimated. Okay. There seem to be there are a lot of kind of disparate groups kind of doing competing activities yeah and i think i think if there's a way for you to kind of join forces with existing structures i think that could be that could really i mean it could be it could promote powerful change so so just to go deeper into this thought um because we've spoken a lot about culture and we've spoken a lot about creativity and what that means and you know how that's kind of front facing for Nigeria. Um, but what we haven't got into, and it, it'd be another hour discussion, is the politics of the country and the social structure of the country. Um, so from your point of view, do you think that all this creativity and culture that is now at the forefront of the country can play a part in reshaping the politics and the social structure? Um, just as a very quick, you know, clip note, because we just haven't got into that in any way. Do, do you want me to add my, my yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. So I, I, I actually think, I know no one wants to have anything to do with the government at this point, even given the, the events of the past few months. But I actually think um, the creative sector especially needs to almost come together um, to put together some sort of creative alliance um, like a powerful creative organization that is going to lobby the government and ensure that the policies that are needed for the, the environment to kind of to, to grow the, the creative environment are put into place. And I, and I say that because um, I, I interviewed um, a business leader um, a few months ago um, about navigating the pandemic in Lagos. And one of the things she said, which I thought was really astute, is that if you're not involved in shaping the policies in your country, those policies are going to be shaped for you. Okay, I think that's a perfect way to segue into Grace. Thank you so much for that, Ijoima. Uh, Grace, can you just um, add 
a little note in terms of like you know you've done it now you know you've you've taken you've taken your time you, you you studied the country you spent some time you understood what the needs were and you went back and you added something you know i think that's oncoming is something that people look forward to internationally and in in the country itself but if you were to give you know because there's a lot of people are throwing questions in the chat it's actually going quite crazy right now but if you were to just give us like a real kind of like succinct version of what you think is needed right now going back to that country that you think would help in any way whether it's socially politically or on a creative level what would that thing be for you i think there's yeah it's a bit of a two part so first of all i think that what everyone said about like you know really amplifying people's voices that's great i think that the the power of community is huge and i think that that is what i grew up in culture with me and a side we've seen this happen before if i look at the music industry in the UK and the community that is built to make that independent industry, that is a business model. That is economical independence in the UK in underprivileged areas. Like it's a similar train of thought. That's what I want to take there. How do we build economical independence in Africa, in Nigeria specifically, through the creative sector? And I think that that's a really important thing. It's not just like, how do we, amplification is great. It gets a, it's an advert. But the business and the economics are important. And I think that, you know, the creative sector, especially the music industry, the film industry, art and photography are all soft powers. They're huge. There's huge business there. And if that money can stay in Nigeria and start building infrastructure there, leading to additional jobs, leading to young people doing internships and, you know, in sectors that they love instead of having to go through the traditional kind of framework of education, then we have a chance at building an economical value in the country. And I'm not saying that that's not happening. There's so many great labels that, you know, what I do love about Nigerian artists in Nigeria, especially all the new gen ones, they look at their deals. They're not messing about. They see what they're signing. They're all on distro deals or license deals. So they understand the importance of ownership and independence. But how do someone like me that's been in the UK and able to see that and build that how do I transfer that skill there? And that's kind of the next mission for 2021 onwards. How do we make sure that all stays in the country? I think that's really important. Yeah, I think we might have to call upon you, Grace, to literally be a leader in a sense of giving people the manual. Because I think it's not yeah. just about the artists themselves. It's about the business structure around them. You, yeah. know, you know, the music industry around the world is usually a mess because of bad management, bad lawyers, bad deals. It's not the artist. The artist's job is to create. So... I think we might have to call upon you at some point, you know, it's to totally do my, It's totally, like, everything that's happened this year has made me understand that, like, what I've loved is that the music industry has been unraveled, and it's for us, the next generation, to put it back together. Everyone knows that the deals are a joke. We've seen, you know, Blackout Tuesday, all of those things happen. It's really important now for us to be fearless in the approach to, like, go home, help to build there. There's things to build there. I want to be part of that. I want to be able to say, like, that's part of my legacy. I helped to build like some infrastructure in a country and it's led to, you know, 20,000 jobs in this industry. That's important to me. Okay, great. Is Adesua still with us? Do we still have you, Adesua? Yeah, she's here. Hi. Hey, hi. So listen, the question that's going around the room, I don't know if you, you caught it at the beginning or you jumped in halfway. It's just simply this, you know, if you're coming back home, you know, as you've done Adesua and like you're doing some really great work at the moment, um, you should actually give us some insight into legacy because that's a really good example of, you know, someone coming back and developing with the people in the country, the artisans, um, something that probably hasn't been looked at or promoted. So for me, the question is very simple. What do you need to take back? What would you like to see people come back with to add on to the country as opposed to subtract from the country? And yeah, please speak about legacy because I think it's really important that people understand what you're doing with that. So I started Legacy about three years ago when I went back home for the first time in about 13 years. And, you know, every Nigerian, every African, we always have these ideas of how do we help? How do we, how do we fix things at home? How do we make our home safe? You know, and um, I remember having like really wild dreams, like I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and da, 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 da. But when you get there, the sun is different <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Everything is entirely different. 
And that's something that people don't talk about is the differences in communication that is very, 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 very important, you know? And there is so many isms that exist here in Nigeria that don't exist in the West that could um, deter anybody who's trying to help. Um, but so basically what I did when I came back was I just, I just learned, I just hung out with people, I just made friends and uh, I tried to see where I could fit in. As um, so as opposed to, as opposed to trying to say, oh, uh, my home needs this, my home needs that. It's saying, okay, no, this is an entirely different infrastructure. It's an entirely different ecosystem. I just need to see what, how I can help. So the idea that I came up with was like, okay, how do I, how do I help the, the average Nigerian reach and become a, a global businessman in the sense of like, how do I get them to be more competitive with other artists around the world, you know what I mean? And so I said I was gonna I was gonna develop um, a website that was gonna eliminate the middleman, and where I would then present their artwork in the same mannerisms that's used to the West. And um, and sorry, sorry, but by 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 doing so, you know, you find out that there's so many things that don't work in Nigeria that. Yeah, you, basically you have to rethink everything and that's what I had to do. I had to learn about everything and try to figure out how things work out and where I ended up was, okay, I said, we are, what, what's the most amazing thing that black people are good at? And I was like, it's art, but what is art? Art is a, is a, is a way of escapism, is a way of healing. And I said, okay, the same man that is making bronze statues from dusk till dawn for tourists that never come, why don't you use that same skills to make bicycles that from, from, from scrap metals that's everywhere? Why, don't, why has nobody tried to make a bicycle that's locally made uh, uh, to, to compete with the expensive imports? You see what I'm saying? Like, why aren't people trying to invent new things that actually help the environment? So I was like, okay, well, art, that's, that's what it's gonna be, you know? Because we all know about the whole isms of government and you know all the different things you have to battle. Uh, back to the first question, A side that you said about uh, what were the problems of uh, being a female in Nigeria? Nigeria is a very, very, very misogynistic place. There's a lot of power abuse, but my job isn't again to fight the system that is there, but rather to move like water in there. You know, it's to say, I understand and respect this and I can't fight every single thing, but what can I do best to fit in there? And so what I chose was art. And because I have, I guess you call it a skill of being able to be, I, I guess I can, I can be anybody at any time. Um, by being, I guess, being raised biracial, you kind of, kind of learn that skill, which is, I guess, similar to code switching, if you will. But, um, so yeah, I can just be friends with anybody. And so I was like, yeah, so what I've been doing is just hanging out with uh, artists, getting to know them, getting to know what they dream about, um, sharing stories, uh, and just really like getting to the point of, after each collaboration, after we've done our project, um, sorry, today was crazy. Um, <laughs> then the artist themselves will be empowered to then go and go forth and prosper. Um, I definitely, sorry, I'm gonna, because we're running out of time and you know, I really want to get deeper into this and I really feel like we need to have a part two and possible part three to this. Tokyo James, um, it'd just be good to get your take um, on a yeah. final note about what is needed in the country. Now that you've been there and you are part of the new structure and you've changed a lot of things by just showing up and building your business. Um, for anyone from the diaspora who, who's listening to this and is interested in kind of like being included, what are the things that you think are needed um, as an insider now that people can bring to the table? Um, I would first of all say to anyone that is planning to come back home, fluidity. And when I say fluidity, I, I talk it from the point of, from the angle of come with an open mind um, and leave all, all, all thoughts of what you knew about Nigeria and leave it, leave it to one side. Um, as, as, being, as someone that has been here for so long, I don't even know if I say I'm still learning, I'm still learning and I'm still going with the process and I'm still figuring it out 
every single day. Like, like hence, hence the word fluidity. You, you have to be able to adjust yourself like that. Um, I just feel that amplification, as other people have said, and collaboration. Those are the two main, three main thing, fluidity, amplification, and collaboration. Whichever sector, whichever sector you may be, whether it's tech, fashion, music, health, whatever it is, it's find, find a place where you can fit in, amplify and, and, and navigate it through that way. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Pepper, do you have anything to add on to that before we take some Q&A from the chat room? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just give a few practical um, tips because uh, I think everybody's journey into Nigeria has been different and, you know, you're not always going to have um, a cushion or, or friends. So um, one of the things that helped me um, was I, I traveled a few times on um, university projects. Um, I was really interested in um, Igbo hip hop um, at the time, you know, the artists you know now were not really existing then. And so I did a dissertation on um, language and how that's a, you know, powerful identifier and um, a signifier of identity. And, and that was like my first, like, okay, I'm, I'm really in the trenches. And then I did my national youth service. So for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's like a compulsory um, youth service, like a government program for one year. And what that helped me do was I was, I was in Nigeria for a year um, and I was able to then, you know, do my youth service, but then find opportunities to work with um, individuals that I was interested in their work and obviously um, work on other projects. Um, and so what that helped me do was I, I wasn't necessarily um, going in um, kind of like a, as a novice. I was kind of building my network very slowly, meeting people like TJ um, and just being able to kind of build my network so that when I was kind of clear on what I wanted, um, it wasn't going to be a major shock to me as a cultural shock that tends to happen when you do go to Nigeria for the first time. And also, uh, you might be prepared to take a pay cut as well. So what you might know as a salary uh, or, you know, the things that you'd enjoy working in London. That's real. But That's real. As a creative, you, you have to be willing to take, you know, some cuts and some shortcuts. And again, this idea of being very open minded, it's like nothing you've ever seen before. But then if you're consistent and you are your heart's in the right place, um, the, the benefits will obviously be, you know, I mean, it's your home. So I believe that so far as you're, you know, touching ground and you're doing um, things that are sincere, it, it will be fine. So that, that's what I would just add. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. So we've basically got two minutes of, of, of kind of like the hour. Um, we could spill over if, if people are here for it. Um, going to take a few questions, a Q and A, there's loads in the chat. Some of it, some of the topics we've covered already, but um, one of the questions that actually that popped up is, just the idea of technology and how it's used in Africa and how it's helped propel change and progress. Um, I had a conversation with Shaney um, maybe a month ago, just talking about how, you know, during the SARS protests and that situation, um, without the kind of, how can we say, the non-traditional media use of technology, a lot of the information would have made it out of the country. So Shaney, are you still here? Yeah, I'm back. Never tried to get me, but I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's another reality. <laughs> the technology. So I just want you to touch upon very quickly just the role that technology's pl played in propelling your business forward and kind of helping you communicate because we were just talking about the fact that there was so much um, kind of uh, red tape <laughs> around the information when the SARS protests were happening and there was a lot of kind of censorship. Um, just give us a kind of like an anecdotal take on that. I mean, for us, like Native as a prime business is a magazine, like print and obviously um, digitally we have a website. And that is not something that's new, but I guess a lot of publications based in Nigeria have kind of stemmed from traditional media. Like it's come from either a newspaper editor leaving a massive publishing house or that kind of thing. So there's a kind of way of, that they do things. And I think a big issue with the news and the media and publishing in Nigeria for a long time has been they're set in their ways and a lot of people aren't really essentially not catering to young people. Um, and when you speak to a lot of the older editor in chiefs and publishers, you know, they're like, oh, young people don't read, young people don't care, etc. etc. And for us at Native, we I, first of all, we know that's not true. 
a number of shows that the young people do read and they do care about stuff that they care about like anyone else. And when it came to reporting on what I'd call like society news, like, you know, news, not music news or fashion news, but things are happening on a day to day basis, we took that decision that we were going to be a platform that young people could come to to see what was going on. We know we have a big diaspora following and we know that they, they want to know what's going on. They're worried about their friends and family back here. And we wanted to be that place where someone like a UA side or whoever could be like, oh, okay, so that's what happened today. Or, oh, actually, you know, the military or the police said this happened, but that's not true. Like in the media publishing world, you know, people are kind of seeing it as like a stamp of approval. If the Nigerian police Twitter account put fake news on your article, that was like, like oh yeah, I mean, that must be true then. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was definitely a very um, enlightening period for a lot of us. And it kind of just showed us the power of what media could do in like a new age of technology. Amazing. Thank you so much. Listen, um, we're going to wrap this up. Unfortunately, there's so many questions and we just don't have enough time. Uh, we'd love to revisit this again with everyone um, very soon because I think there's so many questions from the chat room. There are a few more questions that have arisen based on what you guys have said. I really appreciate your time. I want to thank Sammy Janja from Consul, um, part of the Black Discourse team. I want to thank Zion Estrada for producing this and Jamoki Adekunle for um, introducing us some of the brilliant guests today but thank you very much everyone and hopefully everyone's got some insight and some information from this um follow us on black discourse um dot co which is on instagram and uh, someone said we should bring this to clubhouse it will probably be there for eight hours but anything's possible so we'll figure out in the future but i appreciate you so much adesua shaney grace pepper ijoima and tokyo james um thanks for popping in and for sharing your points of view. Appreciate you guys.